Hi everyone, I've just started the webinar and I'm just going to wait a minute to kick off um, before so we can wait for people to, to join us virtually. How often do you do these, Renee? Uh, we do them once a month, so this is our final one for the year. Okay, nice. Yes. Um, and yeah, we'll be kicking back off up, uh, back off again in February. So having the, the summer off. Yeah, of course. So Are you taking leave over, over um, the end of the year? Yeah, so we'll, this is our last week of teaching. And then at UEA, we start teaching again the 1st of February. So a bit longer this time. I think they wanted to make adjustments for the new teaching arrangements. We're, we're all online, basically. Oh, great. Can you say, um, can you say that little message? Uh, no. I think because I've got the whole screen as my PowerPoint. Oh, Adam is saying hi, Jamie. Lovely to see you. <laughs> All right, look, I think it's, it's one past four. I think we're in, um, entitled to kick off. But before I um, begin, um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge the Wurundjeri people upon whose lands I currently live and work and that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, hi everyone, my name is Renee Fomiati and I'm a researcher at the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society. Uh, as you might have heard Jamie and I talking about, this is our monthly um, research and practice seminar series. Uh, this month, we're very lucky to have Dr. Jamie Hakeem joining us at, I think, what I think is 5 a.m. in the morning to speak about pandemic intimacies, gay and bisexual men mediating intimacy during the coronavirus conjuncture. Jamie is a lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia. His research interests, interests lie at the intersection of digital cultures, intimacy, embodiment and care. And his book, Work That Body, Male Bodies in Digital Culture, was published by Roman and Littlefield in 2019. Just before I hand over to you, Jamie, I'll just let everyone know that Jamie's going to speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. Um, I'd encourage everyone to raise their virtual hand and I can switch on your mic and then you can ask your questions yourself. But um, if not, please feel free to submit your questions via the chat function and um, we can do it that way. All right, Jamie, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, thanks Renee, and uh, thank you uh, Renee and everyone at Archers for inviting me to speak uh, this morning, your afternoon. I was actually meant to be in Australia now um, visiting you guys, but obviously um, everything stopped. So um, it is early, but I am pleased to be, uh, be talking to all of you. Um, okay, so uh, good afternoon or good morning everyone. My name is Jamie Hakim and as Renee said, I'm a lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia. Um, in the UK. Um, I'm also principal investigator on the ESRC funded project, Digital Intimacies, how gay and bisexual men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. We're an interdisciplinary project drawing on expertise in cultural studies, sociology of health and social anthropology. And we're partnered with sexual health organizations, the Terence Higgins Trust, London Friend and Waverley Care. One of our aims is to offer uh, another way of understanding digital intimacies to the platform user approach that's often taken in digital sociology and that focuses on user experiences of specific platforms, often hookup apps in the gay and bi male context. Instead, we want to understand how gay and bi men use the various affordances of their smartphones and smart devices as tools to navigate the specificities of the cultures of intimate of their cultures of intimacy or our cultures of intimacy as they take shape in a certain time and place in London, Edinburgh and the east of Scotland at the end of the 2010s, beginning of the 2020s. Our focus, therefore, is gay and bi men's cultures of intimacy in which the smartphone has come to play a critical, though not absolutely central role. And here we understand culture as both the discourses that inform commonly held ideas about gay and bi male smartphone mediated intimacies and the material conditions in which these intimacies are practiced. We've therefore separated the project into three work packages. Work package one looks at these material conditions, 
focusing on the material resources available to gay and bi men that enable or constrain their cultures of intimacy. So for example, we look at the physical spaces where the cultures are practiced, the healthcare available to them and the digital infrastructures they use. Work package two looks at the discursive conditions of these cultures by analyzing the cultural representations of gay and bi male smartphone mediated intimacies from film, television, social media content, and so on. And in work package three, we're aiming to interview around 45 gay and bisexual men from London, Edinburgh, and the east of Scotland about how they use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. Our analysis involves working across and integrating these data sets the whole way through the project. We've almost finished the data collection for the project, having interviewed 39 gay and bi men. That's 28 in London and 11 in Scotland. So today I'm going to be talking about the themes that have begun to emerge at this point. And this analysis is based on the 25 London interviews that have been transcribed. And I'm testing out ideas for the first time and very grateful to receive any feedback on kind of what I'm talking about. So the talk has three parts. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to introduce how we're conceptualizing intimacy uh, in the project and drawing on the work of Lauren Ballant, Jeffrey Weeks and Stuart Hall, we understand intimacy as a resource that differently positioned gay and bi men struggle over in order to sustain their lives. I will then sketch an outline of the various struggles over uh, intimacy that gay and bi men are engaged in during this current historical moment. One of these struggles, the struggle over intimacy during the coronavirus pandemic. I'll first look at intimacy at the interpersonal level and finish by looking at the struggles happen happening in relation to gay and bisexual men's collective spaces of intimacy. Okay. So as I said, the conceptualization of intimacy that we're currently working with combines aspects of the work of Lauren Ballant, Jeffrey Weeks and Stuart Hall. From Lauren Ballant, we take her definition of intimacy as connections we depend on for living. Defining intimacy in this way was a deliberate move on her part to take into account the multiplicity of queer intimate practices that exceed conventional understandings of intimacy, heteronormative, long-term, couple-based, and carried out in the private sphere. It also draws attention to what's at stake in these intimate practices, their capacities to sustain life. From Jeffrey Weeks, we take the idea that for gay men, as well as other social groups, the struggle for sexual and intimate citizenship has been one of the, if not the defining struggles of contemporary politics. And he uses political battles such as the struggle for the decriminalization of homosexuality, against section 28, and for and against gay marriage as examples. But unlike Jeffrey Weeks, our understanding of struggles for and over intimacy whilst including these battles for citizenship, is equally as concerned with the struggle at the level of culture. Remember, the project is interested in cultures of intimacy. And this is where we turn to, this is where we turn to Stuart Hall, particularly the way he uses the thought of Antonio Gramsci to understand culture as an arena of hegemonic struggle, a place where consent to cultural norms and value systems is fought over, lost and won. When it comes to struggles for intimacy, questions of citizenship are vital, but so too is the struggle over what constitutes a culture's norms and values, thought by Hall and the tradition of cultural studies that he helped found to be accessible through cultural representations and practices and the thoughts and feelings of ordinary people. In bringing these perspectives together, we understand intimacy as a resource that for our purposes, gay and bi men struggle over to sustain our lives, or at least to make our lives more livable. So this struggle has different dimensions, discursive and material. The discursive struggle is over what intimacy means, which types and practices of intimacy are and are not legitimate or socially sanctioned or authentic. The material struggle is over the resources and infrastructures of intimacy. And these struggles can be further organized into three different categories. 
the intracommunal, struggles with the state, and struggles with capitalism. The intracommunal are the internal struggles that gay and bi men have amongst ourselves. Some we can call relational. So what are the intimate relationships that gay and bi men should have with each other? And what do these relationships mean? These include the intracommunal struggle for and against gay marriage, or the debates over gay men's cultures of non-monogamy. Some we could call intersectional, in the place that different intersections, ethnicity, gender identity, class, disability, and so on, play in access to intimacy. So the struggle around sexual racism is one example. Gay and bi men's intimacy struggles also take place with the state. Jeffrey Weeks and Ken Plummer's work on sexual and intimate citizenship, intimate citizenship is illustrative here, but so too is the work on biocitizenship, with the recent struggle to have PrEP freely available on the NHS to anyone who needs it being a recent example. Then there is also gay and bi men's struggle with capitalism. And there are different scholarly perspectives on what the relationship between gay and bi men and capitalism is or has been. Gay liberation theory held that homosexuality and capitalism, at least in its Fordist mode, were incompatible. More recent work has argued that gay men, white, middle class, homonormative and able-bodied, have been some of the chief beneficiaries of neoliberal capitalism. The fate of metropolitan gay scenes in cities like New York and London at the hands of neoliberal gentrification suggests a more complicated story as does the so-called deplatforming of sex, whereby many mainstream social media platforms are banning sexual content in a bid to increase their advertising revenues. This has had a particularly adverse effect on all categories of queer folk who've historically relied on these platforms to connect and share information about their sexuality with other queer folk around the world. Aspects of these struggles, struggles overlap. For instance, the struggle over gay marriage has both intracommunal and state dimensions. There are also obviously different positions within these struggles. Different struggles settle during some historical moments and come alive at others. The sudden global visibility of the Black Trans Lives Matter movement in 2020 being a case in point. And these struggles have become particularly fraught during the culture wars over the past few years which in the UK, the authoritarian populist wing of the Conservative Party, as well as right-wing media, has attempted to start with varying degrees of success. So according to this Gramscian approach to cultural analysis, the shape and direction of an historical conjuncture is defined by the form and content of its hegemonic struggles and the relationship between them. In a strictly Gramscian sense, this approach is used to understand class relations during a particular historical conjuncture, but over time it's been used to understand, or versions of it have been used to understand, for example, race relations in the work of Stuart Hall and gender relations in the work of Raymond Connell and her various collaborators. Combined with Weeks and particularly Ballant, this approach is proving especially helpful for us to think about the role that the smartphone is playing in gay and bi men's cultures of intimacy. It's helped us map the parameters of the complex, both overlapping and divergent tendencies of these cultures in a particular place and time, parts of the UK at the beginning of the 21st century, as well as the multiple, multiple positions it's possible for differently situated gay and bisexual men to take up within them. It's also helped us understand what's at stake in these struggles, why they're so passionately defended and fought over. If intimacy refers to the connections we depend on for living, then the struggle over it is a struggle over life itself, or at least the struggle to make life more livable. So what are the struggles that are defining gay and bisexual men's cultures of intimacy now? And I'm talking about popular struggles, struggles within popular culture, not the scholarly debates. We're slowly building this picture as the project progresses, but the themes that have so far emerged are these. First, the ongoing struggle over whether digitally mediated intimacies are authentic or not, and how this fits into longer conversations about the meanings and meaningfulness of gay male non-monogamy. Second, the struggle over the rapidly diminishing counter-public spaces available to gay and bisexual men to practice different forms of intimacy, and the role that smartphone-mediated intimacy 
or gentrification have played in that. Third, what we might call intersectional struggles and the particular form they're taking in the current conjuncture. I've already touched upon the increased visibility of the Black Trans Lives Matter movement. We might also think about the circulation of the discourse on white gays on social media, whereby the relative privilege of able-bodied fit white gay men in LGBT plus cultures is now routinely critiqued in memes and other forms of online commentary. And the related rise of cutie pop, so queer, trans, intersectional, person of color, cultural production in similar cultural spaces. The term intersectionality itself has never been so widely discussed in popular culture. Finally, at least at this point in the project, is the struggle over what gay and bi male intimacy should look like during the coronavirus pandemic and the role that the smartphone and other smart devices are playing in that. Sorry, I didn't caffeinated. Um, okay, so I'm going to spend the remainder of the presentation focusing on this struggle. And as we see it, this struggle has two dimensions. The struggle over gay and bi male intimacy at the interpersonal level and the struggle over the communal spaces where these cultures of intimacy are usually negotiated. I'll take each of these in turn. First, I'll outline these struggles by talking through the different positions which define their parameters. I'll then draw on our interview data to show the positions taken up by our participants within them. Ultimately, what I'm asking in the rest of the presentation is, how are, how are gay and bi men negotiating their cultures of intimacy during the coronavirus pandemic, obviously in the UK, and how have these negotiation, negotiations helped them sustain their lives? So the first reports of coronavirus in the UK appeared in late 2020. The UK government's response to the unfolding global pandemic can euphemistically be described as haphazard. So this is a picture from the Daily Mirror of a report where Boris Johnson was shaking people's hands in COVID wards. So rather than take um, a zero transmission approach, Boris Johnson's Conservative Party first opted for herd immunity, which was thrown out the window after a couple of weeks, um, and then instead opted for flattening the curve introducing different levels of social distancing restrictions at different points over the past year to ensure that the NHS, which had been eviscerated by 10 years of Tory austerity, was not overwhelmed by COVID patients. These restrictions were at their most severe between March and July 2020, when UK residents were prohibited from mixing with anyone outside of their households only being allowed to leave their house for essential or an, uh, shopping or an hour of exercise. They also meant the closing down of non-essential businesses and the banning of mass gatherings. These restrictions relaxed over the summer and have tightened up again to different degrees during the second wave of the Northern Hemisphere's cooler months. Rely to, relying on society's withdrawal to private households in place of a robust or even just competent public health response may have been necessary to slow community transmission, but it has had unevenly distributed implications for different social groups in the UK. So the increase in domestic violence has been a result for some women, as has the greater death rates in low income black and ethnic minority groups who, unlike the white British middle class, are more likely to live in large intergenerational households. So gay and bisexual men have been affected the, by the pandemic in specific ways, given the particular features of our cultures of intimacy. These features include a blurring of the normative boundaries between friendship, romance and casual sex, the greater though contested significance of casual sex and non-monogamy, and a greater dependence on counter public spaces where these cultures of intimacy are practiced in short, gay scenes and the particular digital infrastructures of intimacy, such as hookup apps and other digital platforms. So as I'm just about to show, together these features meant that confinement to domestic private space and the prohibition of interaction between households has, uh, has been difficult in particular ways for gay and bisexual men. When it comes to the discourses on interpersonal intimacies circulating in gay culture at this moment, 
the digital has featured heavily. So between March and August 2020, the Terence Higgins Trust advised gay men to abstain from in-person sex entirely and have digitally mediated phone uh, sex instead. Other organisations such as Prepster um, developed harm reduction strategies for gay men who still wanted to have in-person sex. This is uh, a series, this is one slide from a series of um, comics they, introduced, they developed. So these strategies including having sex in a shower, having sex outdoors, avoiding kissing and face-to-face -face interaction, and only hooking up with one regular corona buddy. This advice also included practicing digitally mediated sex. Media outlets that addressed gay men and other queer folk devised creative ideas for digital intimacies, including Zoom meals, binge watching TV shows using Netflix party, and visiting each other in Animal Crossing. If these were the parameters that shaped the common sense on what uh, interpersonal intimacies were practicable between UK-based gay and bi men during lockdown, which is basically abstinence versus harm reduction, the picture that our participants have so far painted of the intimacies they actually practiced and how they did or did not sustain their lives was complex. Most of our participants made a distinction between the first three months of the pandemic when social distancing was at its most severe during the first UK lockdown. We have a second UK lockdown in, in November and, and then the months afterwards. So in line with survey findings from the London School of Health and Tropical Medicine, which showed that three quarters of gay men stopped hooking up altogether, many of our participants did abstain from having sex with someone from outside their household during this time. Some appreciated the break from the pressures of hookup culture. So this is Ryan. Personally, I mean, I'm just less likely to meet people in person. And I think with lockdown, it's been almost like a helpful break from. I mean, COVID in general, I think, has been a nice break from everything to unplug as a world. Most, however, struggled with different aspects of not having sex. And David's reflections on this were typical in this regard. He says, I probably logged into Grindr once a day during lockdown, didn't message once. I kind of used Tinder for a bit, but I got bored of it. I felt like I was just on pause. The exact words I've used is I was on pause. My entire way of living, my way of interacting online was just on pause. Yeah, I was just like in horny prison for months, like not talking to anyone, not doing anything. I would not break lockdown, so I wasn't meeting anyone. People would message me on Grindr and be like, do you want to meet up? And I'm like, there's a lockdown going on. Intimacy was just on hold. I remember being, I guess the word is touch starved. Interviewee Matthew goes further than touch starved, saying that having only had sex with two men between March and his interview in October had left him traumatically affected. Other participants developed their own harm reduction techniques. So for example, our interviewee Gareth, who prior to the pandemic enjoyed group sex on London's BDSM scene, set up an arrangement between five regular Corona buddies. This arrangement was based on their thinking that the lack of mask wearing in public put them more at risk than only having sex with each other. And if they, did, if they didn't have this arrangement, they would snap and go on the apps at random. They trusted each other to keep their mutually agreed rules, which they renegotiated each time social distancing restrictions were tightened and or relaxed. Other participants simply reduced the amount of hookups they would ordinarily have, whilst others would, have, would use masks during sex or started using condoms again after not doing so because they were on PrEP. So this quote from Jack is a good illustration of the tense internal negotiations he has continuously had to make in relation to his sex life during the pandemic. So in terms of hookup apps, basically when it was lockdown, well, my phone broke just before I was about to go into lockdown. So I just didn't install the apps because I was like, well, what's the point? I'm going to be tempted. And when things were starting to ease, I was like, well, you know, I'm comfortable traveling on public transport. I'm going to the cinema. I live near a shopping center. So it's not uncommon for me just to go for a wander. So I've done those things. 
and like my mental health's in a place where my libido is sort of high. So, you know, may go venture and start hooking up. So I hooked up with a couple of people. But now, to be honest, I went on the other day and then I was, well, what are you, what are you doing? The R rate's high. So I'm at the stage of, should I come off prep for a bit because there's no point being on it? And that's another, like, if I'm not taking my prep, that's another thing that's going to discourage me from going on the app. Because I feel just like, yeah, it's getting to the stage where it's not safe to be doing it. So at the moment, I'm locking myself down again. So for Jack, the struggle to negotiate sex and intimacy during the pandemic is in a state of constant flux. His negotiations take into account the R rate, the different lockdown restrictions of different moments of 2020, comparisons between how safe sex and just mixing in public spaces, his mental health and, lib and his libido, which was higher he felt because he was at a certain stage of his transitioning process. I think what's interesting about the section of the interview that this quote is taken from is that unlike Gareth and his five Corona buddies, Jack does not feel resolved in his decisions regarding his intimate life at any one time during the pandemic. The different factors that have to be considered, the way these factors shift from month to month, all of this produces a sense of frustration at the almost impossible negotiations the pandemic has entailed and that could be felt across many of the interviews we've so far carried out. So a central focus of the project is obviously smartphone use. And just as, as was advised by sexual health organizations and across queer media, digital devices were used by our participants in creative ways to negotiate their intimate lives. So one of our interviewees, Matthew, had one of those lockdown boyfriends that so many seem to have had. They met on Hinge and decided not to break lockdown so had a full-on virtual relationship for four months conducted entirely on zoom they watched television together they slept ne excuse me they slept next to each other through their smartphones and used zoom and skype for sex they eventually broke up because matthew's lockdown boyfriend wanted him to break lockdown and matthew wouldn't but another man would when we asked whether he experienced that relationship as intimate he says that's probably the most intimate I've been. I would call that intimate. That's the one exception to my definition of intimacy because that was definitely intimate. So he previously stated that intimacy wasn't possible over digital media. Interviewee Leon had a more ambivalent experience of digital intimacy during lockdown. So Leon had had a series of FaceTime dates with two guys that he met on Hinge. He said, that seemed quite sensible What's the point in meeting in real life? Because we can meet on here and realise immediately that we don't like each other. It was quite fun. It was on a Saturday afternoon when we weren't allowed outside. It was peculiar, but yeah, we just chatted and it was good because there was nothing else to do because it was in lockdown. You couldn't meet new people and the prospect of meeting someone new seemed so exciting. However, later on in the interview, he reflected on the strangeness that can come with technologically mediated intimacy. So he says, it does fill the gap to a certain extent, but then you also need face, the face-to-face -face thing. And there's also something to be said about an online interaction. In a normal conversation, you'd expect people to pause and reflect and you can read their, through their body language. And now you can't. And you just get this anxiety that the technology is failing you. And it's quite strange. I think just the technology and people getting delays and lags, I don't think it's ideal. I think honestly, Really, I salute the idea and I appreciate people's like innovation attempts, but I don't think it works. Honestly, really don't. So Gareth, the participant from before, struggled far more with digital intimacy during the pandemic because it reminded him that he couldn't touch the different people with whom he was usually intimate. So he says, during lockdown, there's been a few scheduled video calls, which has been difficult for me. Again, it's the next layer back of meeting them in person. Gives you that reminder I was talking about earlier that, oh my God, I can't kiss you. We can't be close. I don't like this. It's like, it's almost teasing or it's more reminding me what I'm missing with them than it's satisfying what I'm missing. Interviewee Miguel was less ambivalent. 
he says, I tried a Zoom drinks thing and I thought it was the most awful experience I've ever been through. <laughs> okay, so the pictures so far painted by our participants in terms of how they've been negotiating their interpersonal intimacies is complex. A small minority abstained from in-person sex completely, particularly during the first UK lockdown. And a small percentage of those welcomed the break from the pressures of hookup culture. Most, however, struggled to have no or less sex. They also struggled with the new risks that having sex in the age of coronavirus entailed, despite the careful and thought out negotiations that they went through. Some were frustrated, others touch starved, and one claimed he was traumatically affected. When it came to the place of the smartphone and other smart devices in negotiating gay and bi men's intimate lives, a similar picture was painted. Complex, but with a definite trend in the data towards scepticism of the idea that digital intimacy should replace in-person intimacy in whole or in large part, and a sense that purely digital intimacies could not sustain our interviewees' lives as well as they would have liked. Although one interviewee had the most intimate relationship he'd ever had only using his smart devices, for most, the purely digital mediated could not alone sustain them in ways they felt they needed. And before I reflect on this further, I want to discuss how our participants have experienced their collective spaces of intimacy, or lack thereof, during the pandemic. Okay. So one of the defining features of gay men's cultures of intimacy is the greater dependence on public, collective and communal space in which these cultures are negotiated. Again, heteronormative mainstream notions of intimacy tend to privilege the domestic and the private sphere. But even in the age of gay marriage, what Lauren Ballant and Michael Warner have called the counter public sphere has been crucial for gay men. Bars, clubs, cruising grounds, sex on premises venues, pride events and other communal and commercial spaces. I say gay men specifically because other queers experience the counter and uh, sorry the public and counter public sphere in different ways. Okay so during the pandemic these counter public spaces have either been temporarily shut, um, closed down completely or have only been able to operate in a way that makes establishing new intimate relationships very difficult. Given the greater dependency that gay men have had on these public spaces to negotiate their cultures of intimacy, it's perhaps no surprise that the intimacy struggles that have taken place in relation to them have been particularly intense and taken different forms. So, for example, Jeremy Joseph, owner of the biggest gay clubbing brand in the UK, GAY, began a legal struggle with the UK government in the beginning of October, contesting the restrictions placed on bars and clubs in London in the autumn. There have also been struggles over the ethics of large groups of gay men and others gathering in outdoor space, especially in the summer months. So for instance, on Saturday, on Saturday 4th of July, which was also known as Super Saturday because it was the first day which bars could open after lockdown, footage of a busy old Compton Street went viral and were condemned as proof of irresponsible behavior across social media. Similar condemnation happened around similar events in Germany and the US and no doubt elsewhere. To give a sense of the form this struggle took, I'm going to draw on the US context and look at a dispute that high profile gay activist Cleve Jones, a, a US uh, activist who worked with Harvey Milk in the 70s, and the ACT UP veteran Peter Staley had on Facebook about footage of a 4th of July party that took place on Fire Island that again went viral. So in a Facebook status update posted on the 6th of July, Cleve, J Cleve Jones condemned the party in no uncertain terms. He says, words rarely fail me, but I can't express the depth of anger and disgust I feel towards many of the younger people and some older in my, commun in my own community today. You who are so self-absorbed, so nonchalant in your irresponsibility, so arrogantly ignorant and selfish, the last pandemic killed half of my generation of gay men. They died hideously. Are you not aware of that history? Right now, we desperately need our young people to lead the way, to defeat Trump, fight racism, protect our democracy and save the planet. Then we can meet and drink and party the night away again, but not now, not today, 
not with infection rates skyrocketing and hospitals overflowing. How many will die before you wake the fuck up? You break my heart. So Peter Staley responded to Jones with a lengthy post making the point that we need to dismount from our moral high horse in these discussions and recognize the failure in dealing with COVID in the US as a failure of public health and political leadership and not human fallibility. He argued that if we were to make a proper comparison around gay men's practices of intimacy in both pandemics, then we would need to consider the fact that even in 1993, when it was well established that condoms prohibit, prohibited HIV infection, that 20,000 got infected that year and that we were human then as they are now. He rationalized the Fire Island Party in the following way. These guys desperate for some socializing, a human need just FYI, especially after months without it, chose to do it outside, reducing their COVID risk by a factor of 20 by some estimates. Thus the debates around the collective spaces in which gay men's cultures of intimacy are practiced paralleled the forms these struggles took at the interpersonal level, broadly following the well-worn path of abstinence versus harm reduction. And just like gay men's interpersonal pandemic intimacies, the digital's propinquitous capacities or their capacities to bring people together across time and space were understood as a good solution to navigate these particular struggles. As we all know, Zoom and similar video conferencing platforms have become ubiquitous in their remediation of all sorts of social infrastructures during the pandemic. Our participants have spoken of Zoom pub quizzes and drinks with friends, as well as Zoom gay group therapy and Narcotics Anonymous sessions. Some gay nightlife promoters and DJs have sought to remediate different aspects of the gay commercial scene. So for instance, the London Gay Sex Club promoter, Jamie HP, has moved all of his previously live events onto Zoom, charging customers for links to Zoom meetings where gay men sexually perform in front of each other. Another example is Queer Club Night at Queer House Party, which was started the first Friday of lockdown. Queer House Party describes itself as a DJ collective and award-winning virtual queer party that's accessible, interactive, camp, radical, DIY, and punk AF. It has live streamed DJ sets and queer performances every week since lockdown began in March. So none of our participants have so far talked about attending events like this. In fact, the picture here is much less complex than their discussions of interpersonal intimacies with the overwhelming trend in the data showing a very tangible sense of loss and not being able to mix in these publicly accessible physical spaces that have been so instrumental to multiple forms of gay and bi male sociability. So for instance, Ryan says, you don't have the intimacy of a night out. I miss being in a club and being with queer people in that space. And I feel really bad for 18 and 19 year olds who are coming out of school and don't have that space because I think that physical space is so important. It's so affirming to be in a room of gay people or you know, to go out and just meet people or kiss people or flirt with people. I feel that that was really formative. I've been to a drag bar, I'd been to a drag bar or gay clubs long before I downloaded Tinder and I think it really helped. Adebisi builds on Ryan's comments that these physical spaces were not simply places of pleasure, though to my mind that's reason enough to argue for their value, but formative for gay youth by arguing that they are in fact transformative. He says, I really appreciate being able to experience and enjoy queer life. Before the pandemic, there was this club night called Sugar Rush, and it's the only night I've ever been to where they play all the pop music that I like. I was really happy that I got to listen to it in a club full of other queer people who came there for that sort of music. Just that alone has been transformative for my life. And Jack, one of four trans gay men we have so far interviewed, adds another dimension to what, what these spaces can mean for gay men. There's like really frustrating things. Like I just started going back to work after recovering from the first stage of low surgery and I wanted to be going out and I wanted to try some fetish nights and things like that. And there's one that I didn't end up going to. It's like, now that I've had some low surgery, I probably want to go to a sauna. 
but it felt like I just can't at the moment because nothing's happening. And like going to LGBT venues at the moment, it's just nothing's happening. So for Jack, the time spent in sex on premises venues in particular is important for experiencing the developing relationship between his sex and gendered embodiment and identity. Okay, so to end this presentation, I'm gonna offer some brief reflections on what these emerging findings mean for the nascent scholarly debates on intimacy, digital or otherwise during the pandemic. So my first reflection relates to the conclusions that some digital sociologists have been arriving at on the question of digital intimacies during the pandemic. These have largely been positive assessments of the role that digital media have played during a time when physical intimacy can kill us. And I don't think our findings necessarily dispute this. Indeed, one of our participants joked that smartphones were a sort of medication to the whole situation that prevented outbreak of chaos on the streets. And of course, without smartphones, digital platforms, and the internet more generally, I think it's safe to say that the pandemic would have been catastrophic for our intimate lives and much else. However, where our findings differ is in the way they point to digital media's insufficiencies during a time in which this new pathogen has reorganized the material conditions of intimate life in the way that it has. We used to rely on a particular mix of the physical and the digital, and that's now changed. The general trend in an admittedly complex data set is that an entirely digitally, digitally mediated culture of intimacy could not sustain the lives of the majority of our interviewees in the way they would have liked. So this brings me on to my next point. I think it's significant that we're talking about gay, gay and bi men's cultures of intimacy here. There is a lot of compelling scholarship that has shown how vital the digital, especially platforms like Tumblr, has been to the contemporary trans experience, especially for queer, trans and intersex people of colour. In relation to the pandemic, the non-binary writer of colour, Nick Crozara, wrote a long article celebrating digitally mediated club night queer house party, the night I was just talking about. So in it, they argue, it's, so this is a quote, it seemed that those who were used to web-based friendships were flying in lockdown, referring to Cutiepock in particular. I think this is a contentious claim, given that the queer and teen study carried out by UCL and Sussex University found that queer and trans youth disproportionately suffered from anxiety and depression during lockdown. Having said this, I wonder if Krasara's article might point to the different relationships that some gay and bi men have to the collective spaces of their cultures of intimacy in comparison to other categories of queer folk. I think it's fair to say that the balance between what Kane Race has called the communal and technological infrastructures of gay lives and especially white cis gay lives is different to the balance of these infrastructures for other queer groups. Gay men tend to dominate what is sometimes called the LGBT plus commercial scene, despite the fact that this scene rarely appeals equally across these different categories. Moreover, the digital infrastructures of gay male life are more likely to be used to access a greater number of partners for sex in person. This contrasts with uh, the QTPOC use of similar infrastructures, as observed in the Crossara article, in which there is as much, if not more, emphasis on pursuing pl platonic or political solidarities and peer support as there is on intimate relationships. We might hypothesize that the massive asymmetry that now exists between the technological and the communal as a result of the pandemic has therefore affected gay and bi male cultures of intimacy differently to the LBT plus and especially cutie pot cultures of intimacy that were dependent on a different balance of the communal and technological before the pandemic. This also may explain why our findings differ to other research projects interested in digital intimacies during the pandemic. In short, complex intersections of race, gender and sexuality shape the varying extents to which digital technologies can successfully sustain vital intimacies during the pandemic. And this is something we're going to continue to explore as our analysis progresses. So my final point relates to the abstinence versus harm reduction debates that have happened during the pandemic. I might be being presumptuous, but I'm almost certain this audience doesn't need convincing that harm reduction is a better approach than abstinence to sex during a pandemic. 
but I do hope our findings help make that argument as well as illustrate to those organisations and gay leaders what's at stake when gay men or indeed anyone outside of those who comfortably practice asexuality are asked to practice abstinence and the difficulty for many to do so uh, even and perhaps especially during a pandemic. If intimacy refers to the connections we depend on for living then to abstain from it diminishes our capacities to sustain our lives during an historical conjuncture when it has been a particular struggle to make our lives livable at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jamie. Ah, you're back. Well, we're both back. Um, thank you so much. That was um, really wonderful and a really um, great way to finish this year living in the shadow of COVID and trying to get a, get a grip uh, get a grip on everything that's happened. Um, I'll invite people, if you've got any questions, to please um, uh, put your questions in the chat function or raise your hand, as I said before, and I can um, turn on your microphone. Um, I have the beginnings of a question, uh, as, as a group, um, always should, but um, um, I'll wait a minute, um, a minute or not a minute, I'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone has anything to say. Okay, uh, the question I have is actually, um, I was um, being very virtuous and reading some of Kane Race this morning, um, just for some of my own thinking. So um, I was just, so I was kind of, I was having, um, I was just thinking a bit about what Kane Race has um, written about, about sexual infrastructures, um, as you were talking, Jamie. And so bear with me, um, I don't know if I've quite formed this properly, but yeah, Kane kind of writes about certain digital formats and sexual infrastructures giving rise to effective um, or affective climates. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 is, you're writing about how COVID-19 has been entangled with these digital um, and sexual infrastructures and has produced a focus on intimacy and people have been um, ha playing around with new experimentations with intimacy. And one of the things I was wondering about and whether or not any of your participants have spoken about this, and I think you kind of have, you know, you're touching on this with um, being forced to make a choice, I think, between harm reduction and abstinence. But I'm wondering um, if and how the kind of cultural memory um, or ramifications of a HIV as the pandemic or the, you know, the original pandemic that um, is constantly attached to, to gay men, how this, or if it did, play out in gay men's experiences of digital intimacy. Um, you know, if, if people, I mean, and I'm thinking about this mainly because a, a close friend of mine said, as someone who hadn't lived, um, through the pandemic that he, you know, he really uh, started to think about his uh, body and sexual practices and digital practices in a really new way. So that's, yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. Just if that yeah, that's, No, that's a great question, Renee. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not, I didn't do these interviews, which is the first for me in the project. Um, so normally I'm able to draw very kind of quickly on my memory of speaking. To no, no, that's okay. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm just kind of getting through the kind of interviews mm. that get Right. But I mean, I mean, I'm trying to think if if I can remember a couple of the older people that we spoke to that had the memory of the first kind of you mm. know we were living through the pandemic, the HIV epidemic in a particular way mm. in the West. They lived through it in a particular way in the 80s and 90s. I mean, I want I kind of want to say yes, even though I can't um, uh, perhaps draw on participants that talked about it. And of course, I think, you know, even someone of my generation, I mean, even younger, I mean, any gay man is living mm. still in its shadow. I of mean, course. Uh, continuously think about, um, um, uh, you know, HIV, whether it's we're taking PrEP or we're taking, you know, or people, positive people are taking the drug. You know, it's still very much part of our conscious mm. interview, even though it wasn't what it was mm. um, uh, in the West anyway, um, or the global north or whatever. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's a project that I'm about to start working on with uh, a couple of other people ab about how about how the, the the conjecture of one of my co eyes is that um, this isn't so new to gay men in in the way that you're talking about. In that mm. there is obviously a cultural memory of the kind of horrors of you know mm -hmm. before the. And also maybe just the kind of um, the resistance to, you know, just don't have sex. It's like, you know, you know, don't yeah. touch people. I'm wondering if, it's, you know, we've been here before. There are, um, you know, negotiated uh, practices, uh, you know, that people might be speaking, yeah. you know, some, sure. some of which of your participants were. Yeah. And, and which, you know, um, which made the call for abstinence, particularly from the Terence Higgins Trust, quite surprising. Um, mm -hmm. 
given the cultural memory and the contestations, and I think, that, and, and the Keith Jones kind of um, statement on Facebook, given, you know, the various kind of histories of what, uh, the, the, how, how difficult it would be and what it mm. costs to practice sexual abstinence. So mm. yeah, I think that's good. I think that's a good point. And I think uh, women are continuously living with that. Um, and, and, and I no doubt that is going to come up more as I go through the interviews. I mean, I think that's a great point, Renee, yeah. Mm. Okay, I can see that um, Adam has, um, has his hand up. So I'm just gonna allow um, Adam to talk. On me. Oh, ask to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, yeah. Jamie, lovely to see you. And um, kind of, it's just amazing. I remember you and I sat in the British Library, God, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago, maybe, starting like talking about the idea of this project. And it's just the most exciting thing ever to see it actually like come to fruition. And and you know, when you first started talking about it, of course, you know, you know, you had no idea that COVID nineteen would happen, and that men would find themselves forced into this environment where social and sexual connectivity has to occur or needs to occur um, via digital devices um, in 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 ways we never imagined when you know when you first started thinking about this as a topic. So it's just it's just amazing, really, that. It's so exciting that you've been able to capture these data at this specific point in time. Like COVID has raised a great many challenges, but it's 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 nice to know that someone in research has been able to capitalize in it on it for good as well. Yeah. Um, what was my question? I think um, while well, you're at the start of the day and struggling to get your head into gear, I'm at the end of the day after seven hours of Zoom meetings back to back and struggling to form coherent sentences. I I guess my interest was perhaps unsurprisingly given our previous conversations um is relates to the use of um relates to drug use um and you know there's a lot that's been written about the the role of drugs in sexual context among gay and bisexual men and you and i and many others have despaired upon about the ways in which it's been constructed as mechanical and irrational and portrayed in very hyperbolic language and i think you know, I remember our very first conversation sat talking about how drugs are actually used by many men as part of intimate encounters, as part of making sex feel more pleasurable and more sensual, sensual and more emotionally connected to others. And I, and I guess really my, the heart of my question is, did you see any of that played out within this kind of context now? Like I, I just, the, the notion of sexual contact in general is, is is so complex and creative in a COVID environment. And I guess I'm just wondering were any of the men that you were interviewing talking about experiences of using drugs in digitally removed or, or, or remote interactions with sexual partners as well? That was a long-winded question. I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, don't worry. Um, I mean, I, I mean, so far, no, actually. And I've been thinking about that because um, that London School of Health and Tropical Medicine um, study that I referred to, um, one of the variables they found was that a tiny percentage of their participants um, had increased the amount of chemsex they were having or drugs, sexualized drug use they were doing. And the person who presented on this um, in the webinar was say, was hypothesizing that it's because well, there's nothing else to do. Um, so, you know, why not? Um, but no, they haven't. And I think that's, um, I think that's partially the way that we're constructing our sample and the questions that we're asking. and in the previous work I've done on chemsex, I, I deliberately went out and asked people about chemsex. And, I, you know, it's, it's interesting for me to reflect on um, the ways that, uh, uh, how we're constructing our sample and the questions we're asking people and using the word intimacy a lot in the kind of, ad, you know, the recruitment materials. And I mean, I, I know that scholar, in scholarship, people talk about chemsex in relation to intimacy. I mean, perhaps people don't, perhaps people, people aren't speaking to us about, so far people haven't spoken to us about, um, about it and that is no doubt not because it's not happening um there's a guy called christian muller who does some interesting work around um mediated um uh chemsex parties and um i kind of wondered actually whether they um 
or happening more now. But no, I mean, Adam, I wish I could say, I mean, I, would, I was fascinated to know that, and, but we haven't come across anything like that. I mean, we, have, we, haven't di we haven't deliberately asked anyone. And so I think people are talking about different things, whether they're doing it or not. So unfortunately, there's nothing yet. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. It was just a curious yeah. interest. We observed, we had a, a cohort online survey running throughout COVID with some colleagues at the Kirby Institute. And, and we observed that there was a reduction in drug use um, a reduction in crystal meth use in particular, but there was still a reasonable cohort of men who carried on using all throughout that period, even though they were reporting having less sex and fewer sexual partners. So, you know, that kind of would suggest they're using drugs um, by themselves um, in socially or physically distanced relationships, uh, either as part of, you know, masturbation or they're having it connected with other people th through smartphone technologies. And I was just interested but it, you know it's a, it's a conversation or a project for another day maybe yeah yeah no i mean i think anecdotally i just know people are drinking more wine and so it I just makes sense that <laughs> yeah it's not down for a bit more interesting people are, are <laughs> taking some sort of drugs but yeah more interesting thanks adam uh we have another question here from shiva i hope i pronounced your name right shiva i'm just i'm just gonna uh, put your mic on Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Uh, so I guess I don't have an answer. Yeah, so this is just a question, uh, I, a half-baked question, but I was just thinking, um, I guess the idea of harm reduction is complex due to the nature of the way COVID-19 spreads. So one person's harm reduction could potentially kill others. Um, in the sense, HIV spread in a very different way. So we're talking about two qualitatively um, different things. So I guess, you know, where would harm reduction sit alongside um, a sense of social responsibility and the responsibility we have to, to those we live with, like maybe um, older parents or grandparents, for example, for some people? Um, or, or is harm reduction a form of social responsibility and do we just accept the risks? I don't know, um, but that's what I was wondering. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shiva. I mean, I, I don't have a position on that. I mean, I'll conduct my own life in a particular way. I guess I'm just kind of reporting on what the, the struggles that our, um, the struggles that our uh, participants talked about and, um, and some were more or less responsible. I'm not, you know, uh, thinking about different kind of ethical frameworks. Um, I guess what I'm just trying, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess any eth the ethical position that I kind of come to from this is that, um, is that people struggled with this and that possibly, so that guy with his five coronavirus, I don't know whether what he did was safe or whether it was his, his negotiation of it's less safe, it's more safe to have sex with his five regular coronavirus instead of going out without a mask in the supermarket. I don't, I have, I mean, how can we know? I don't know. Um, I guess the only, um, I mean, maybe some people can, there are probably epidemiologists that, that, that know about that. I mean, I, I don't. Um, I, I'm, I, the, the ethical position that I had was the, I just, I just think people should be a little bit more generous around the difficulties of living through this moment, I guess, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Very kind of harsh moralizing that happens across the political spectrum that I get where everyone's scared, um, people have died people are going to continue to die and I understand the fear and where that might come from but I also think that we need to be attentive to we we, um, we I think I think in the previous presentation I framed it that we need to I, I urge an intersectional consideration of why certain practices might be more or less difficult for some people than they might be for others and so I yeah I mean I I'm not I'm not judging my participants I suppose and I'm not imposing an ethical framework I'm, I'm just kind of asking that we think about this intersectionally and why certain intimate practices might be more or less practicable for some others than not and like Peter Staley people are fallible and not always able to mm. live up to an ideal ethical position so yeah I yeah I mean I'm not a public health person I imagine there's very well developed um kind of arguments around harm reduction which I can't speak to but yeah, sorry, that's... No, thank you. No, no, no. All good. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, I think that brings us up to um, five o'clock our time. Is it 6am your time, Jamie? 
basic plan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what was that? Sorry, you already done a day's work now. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, you can. You're you're off. Take the whole day off now. Um, look, I think that's it. So I'll just thank everyone um, for joining us, and um, please, everyone, raise your virtual hands and thank Jamie um, for joining us at this um, ungodly hour. Uh, and that's the the end of the seminar today, and the end of the seminar series this year. So thank you, everyone, who's been um, coming along. Um, and there's. Oh, Kate Sears saying she appreciate, uh, appreciates you doing this at such an early time, Jamie. <laughs> thank you, Kate. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for hosting me. It's been great. It's been really great. No worries. Very nice to meet you. It's um, been an absolute pleasure and I hope to see you in Melbourne next year. And hopefully we can move our seminar series um, back in real life uh, next year. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great end of year break. Bye. Bye, Jamie. Okay, thanks.